Hello boys and girls and welcome to another children's meeting coming to you from Six Mile Cross Free Presbyterian Church. This is hard to believe but this is now week 10 of our online children's meetings and it's also hard to believe because this is us into the month of December. The year is almost over and it's so amazing to think how quickly this year has gone in. But boys and girls we're rejoicing once again in the Lord's goodness and even this opportunity once again to come and have this time with you in the online children's meeting. We're looking forward to singing the choruses together. We're looking forward to doing uh, the memory verse, to doing the story, and then we'll finish as always with the quiz at the end. So when the choruses come on now, you just join in and you sing at home. strong and so mighty there's nothing my god cannot do my god is so big so strong and so mighty there's nothing my god cannot do the rivers are his the mountains are his the stars are his handiwork too my god is so big so strong and so mighty there's nothing my god cannot do Before we come to our memory verse tonight we're going to bow our heads and close our eyes and we're going to ask for the Lord's help to learn this verse tonight. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father we thank you that you've given to us the Bible and we thank you Lord for the opportunity that we have tonight to learn this verse from thy word. We pray that thou wilt help us Lord to store it in our hearts and we pray Lord that thou wilt bring forth fruit in our lives from it. We just pray that thou would bless every boy and girl who is listening in tonight and every adult at home as well. And for those who take part in the meeting, Lord, we pray that thou would be with them and help them. Help them, Lord, to bring thy word in simplicity and truth, and that it might be a blessing unto thee. For in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You've already learned seven verses in Psalm 121, and tonight we come to the last verse, verse 8, and the Bible says in Psalm 121, verse 8, The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in, from this time forth and even forevermore. This whole psalm has been telling us about the care and the love and the protection that God has for his children. And verse 8 is like a summary of the psalm. And it says, The Lord, the Lord is, the God, is God. The Lord shall preserve. And preserve is simply a big word meaning to keep. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in. And that just means your day-to-day -day life. No matter where you go in this world, the Lord goes with you and he will keep you from this time forth and even from forevermore. So that is talking about from the time that you have asked the Lord into your heart, that God will keep you from that time forth, from that very moment, God will be with you and keep you in his salvation, even forevermore, right throughout all eternity, God has promised to keep us. So what we're going to do is tonight we're just going to keep repeating this over and over again and we're going to repeat it probably about four times and we just we're not going to stop in between the times when we repeat it we're just going to keep going and you watch the screen and it's going to get smaller and smaller but every time that you say it you'll find you know it a wee bit better so it'll not matter if it gets smaller you'll still be able to say it. So are we already after two then? One, two. The Bible says in Psalm 121 verse 8, The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. 
The Bible says in Psalm 121, verse 8, The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. The Bible says in Psalm 121, verse 8, The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. The Bible says in Psalm 121, verse 8, The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Mr. Noah built an ark, the people thought it such a lark. Mr. Noah pleaded so, but into the ark they would not go. Down came the rain in torrents, down came the rain in torrents, down came the rain in torrents, and only it were saved. The animals went in to buy two, the elephant, giraffe, and the kangaroo. All were safely stored away on that great and awful day. Dying came the rain in torrents, splash, splash. Dying came the rain in torrents, splash, splash. Dying came the rain in torrents, and only eight were saved. Whenever you see a rainbow, whenever you see a rainbow, whenever you see a rainbow, remember God is love. Okay, boys and girls, that was good singing once again, and I want to thank you for joining in the choruses this evening. We're just going to have a word of prayer just before we come to the final part in the story in the life of Ruth. So let's just bow our heads, let's close our eyes as we ask the Lord for his help even now. Heavenly Father, we come to thee once again at the outset of doing this story and we just look to thee for thy help and for thy blessing even upon thy word this evening. We do thank thee, O God, that thy word is even given to us for our instruction. And Lord, we do pray that as thy word goes forward this night that thou would speak to each and every child that they will even learn more, not only of Ruth, but indeed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, bless us and help us now. Fill us with thy spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, boys and girls, if you remember in the last week's story that Ruth was very busy in the land of Bethlehem. She came back with Naomi, and she was very busy at the harvest time. And she'd run out into the fields, and she, by the providence of God and the will of God, she had came to the field of a man by the name of Boaz. And Boaz was there in that field. He was a very wealthy man. And Ruth had went into his field and she was working and working away and she was gleaning behind him. Because as I said, if you remember, widows and those that were poor were allowed to go into the fields and were allowed to lift the scraps, the little bits that fell. And they were allowed to keep them for themselves. It wasn't stealing. It was providing for the poor. And Boaz had came to Ruth. And he had said to Ruth, he says, Ruth, from now on, every day for the rest of harvest, you keep coming back to my field. Don't be going to anybody else's field. You keep coming behind my workers, behind my harvesters, and then you work in my field only. And so Ruth did that every day for the remainder of the harvest time. Ruth got up every morning. She got herself dressed. She got herself ready. And away into the field she went, and she worked day after day. And every evening she'd come home. And she'd be there with Naomi and she'd show Naomi, her mother-in-law, everything that she'd been able to glean that day. You know, as the harvest came to an end, Naomi's mind started to think more and more about their future. And of course, at that time, both Naomi and indeed Ruth were widows. Both their husbands were dead and there was no income. There was no future really for them. There was no system to help them in any way. But according to the law of God, the law had been given to them. The Lord had gave provision even for the widow. And one of the rules and one of the laws within the land of Israel was this. That if a widow died, or if a man, a husband died, the widow that was left, if that husband had any brothers, or even going further out, cousins, or any other family relatives that were male, then that man, if he wasn't married, was to marry the widow. And that way then provision was made for her, for her, care was made for her. 
and her future then was secure. And Naomi, she knew the law of God, and of course, Ruth didn't. She wasn't from that land. And Naomi sat her down one evening, and she said, Naomi, she, or Ruth, she says, I want you to go tonight to Boaz. You see, Boaz is one of our far-out kinsmen. In other words, he's a member of our family circle, and he's not married. And Naomi sat Ruth down and explained everything to do with the custom, everything to do with the law, and how that the law stated that Boaz, or a kinsman, must redeem her. He was going to be known as a kinsman redeemer. And he was the one who was to come and to marry her. And so what Naomi gave her was all of the instruction from God's word, and all of the instruction even to how to go about that evening to come to Boaz, and even to speak to him. And so that evening after they had finished their day's work, Ruth, she got washed once again. She got herself clean after a hard day's work. And she went to where the men were gathered. You see, as I said, the harvest had come to an end. And after the harvest, after all of the crops were brought in, the next work that had to be done was the threshing and the winnowing. And so they gathered all to a place called the threshing floor. And what would happen there at the threshing floor every evening time Whenever the wind was up a bit and it was a bit more gusty, then what they would do was they would lift the barley and they would just throw it up in the air. And then whatever fell to the ground, they kept that. And all of the light little fragments, the chaff off it, would be blown away in the wind and then they wouldn't need that. And so the men in the evening time at the threshing floor, they constantly were lifting it up, just throwing it up in the air, letting it drop, lifting it up, throwing it up, letting it drop. And then they would work and they would work at that because it was a wonderful time. Because they could survey all of the crops, all of the barley, the wheat, whatever else they had gathered in. And they could see God's goodness, they could see God's provision for another year. And there was always much joy at that time. And even after they did all of the threshing for the evening, throwing it up, letting it fall, then they would come together, they would sit down, they would have a meal together. It tells us then that all the men always then slept at the threshing floor. See, you had to protect your crops. You had to make sure that no one would come and steal them. And Boaz, like those other men, he got involved in the work of the threshing. He had his dinner with them. And then he went to lie down at that place even for himself to guard and to watch over his own crops. And Naomi had explained to Ruth exactly what to do. Whenever Boaz would go and lie down for the night and go to sleep, Ruth was to watch from afar and to see where Boaz would lie down. And so whenever Boaz lay down, he put his blanket over the top of him to keep himself warm. He put his wee rug there for his head for a pillow. And then he went to sleep. And Naomi had said the custom was this. Whenever Boaz is there to show the people and even indeed to show Boaz himself the intention of the kinsman and that desire even to be bought back by the kinsman and for the widow to be cared for, then what she would do was she would come in, she would lift the bottom of his blanket and she would put the bottom of her blanket over herself. You see, what that signified was she desired to be under his care. Just as she would be under his blanket, she desired to be under his care, under his protection. So that's what happened when Boaz lay down he put his blanket over him, he went to sleep, and Ruth, she watched from afar. And as everyone else was settling down their different places, Ruth came in, she went to where Boaz was. She lifted the bottom of the blanket, she lay down, and she put the bottom of the blanket over herself. Signifying she wanted, she had that desire to be bought and to be cared for by the kinsman. And Boaz, you can just imagine as Boaz and no doubt he, he woke up with his jump, with a start, because somebody was there. And he says, who is it? Who is it? And Ruth says, it's me. It's Ruth. And she explained to him, and of course he knew the law of God and he knew the custom. And he said, Ruth, he says, I would love to have you as my wife. I would love to fulfill that law. I would love to bring you out of that widowhood and even have you in my home and give that care and that protection, that future for you. He says, but yes, it is true that there is a kinsman, and I am your kinsman. But he says, there is one closer than even me to the family. And the law states that it is the closest kinsman that must uh, have the opportunity 
to fulfill the law first of all. He says, what I'll do, he says, is tomorrow morning I will speak with this man. And I will ask him, I will put it to him if he will come and he will take you to be his wife. And if he will not, then I will fulfill that duty. I will fulfill that role. And so that night, Nea, or that next morning, Ruth, she got up. She went back to her own home. She told Naomi everything. She explained it all. And Naomi said, just leave it with Boaz. Trust Boaz. He will, he will sort it all out. He will meet with the man and everything will be okay. And so that's what Ruth did. She waited patiently that day. And of course, Boaz, true to his word, the very next morning he went to the gate of the city, that area where all of the men would gather together. Boaz, he sat down and he watched and he waited. And that kinsman, after a while, was making his journey in through the city gate. And Boaz, in the custom of that day, instead of just saying, hello, how are you? He said, "Who oh, such a one, sit down here. It's an interesting way of greeting somebody, isn't it? And yet that's what Boaz did. He said to the man, he said, Who oh, such a one, come and sit down here. And then what after, happened after that was, Boaz then gathered ten of the elders of the city. Because in those presence of the elders of the city, this custom was that he would then put the case to the kinsman. And he explained first of all, and he said to the kinsman in the presence of the ten elders, he said, there is a piece of land which belonged to Elimelech. And Naomi's there now and you have the right as the kinsman, as the closest family member, you have the right to buy that piece of land. The man says, yes, I'll buy it, no problem. And then Boaz said, but if you buy the piece of land, then you must also marry Ruth. Because she is a widow and she has that need of protection, that need of care. She has that need of a future and it is your rule, it is your responsibility under the law to then marry her. And the kinsman said, no, I can't marry her. I already have my future planned out. I cannot take this woman to be my wife. And Boaz then said, that's fine, I will buy her back. I will buy the land, and by that, then that means that I will also take Ruth to be my wife. And so another strange custom, another strange tradition of the day, the other kinsman then took off his shoe, and he handed it over to Boaz. And he did that publicly in the presence of all of the elders and the people that were passing by. It showed a transaction. It showed a deal was done. And Boaz then turned to all of the elders with the shoe in his hand. Can you imagine somebody giving you a shoe? If somebody offered to give me a shoe, I'd, I think I'd just cancel the deal. Because some people have very smelly feet. But Boaz, he held up the shoe in front of all of the elders and he says, You have saw this. You are the witnesses to this transaction. And they all said, yes, we are the witnesses. You have agreed, and this man has stepped aside. You are now the kinsman. You are the closest one. The land is yours, and you have the right to marry Ruth. He was the kinsman redeemer. He was the one who bought her. He was the one who cared for her. He was the one who gave what he could even for her. You know, that reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the names of the Lord Jesus is the kinsman redeemer because he buys us out of our sin. And he paid the greatest debt even that he could pay for our sin. He paid with his life. He paid with his own precious blood that we might have eternal life. See, that's why Christ went to the cross. That's why Christ came down into this world. He came down into the world, first of all, to fulfill the law. He lived a perfect life upon this earth. He fulfilled every aspect of God's law, even as Boaz fulfilled the law in his day. The Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the law completely, all of it. And then a transaction had to be made for us. And that transaction, that deal was made as it were, the payment was made when Christ was hanging upon the cross. We chorus that we sing says, He paid a debt he did not owe. And I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And that's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ died upon the cross to pay the debt for our sin. 
And in doing so, he then has the right, he has the privilege, he has that joy of even bringing us even to himself. You know, we can just imagine the joy that there was in Bethlehem. Because in Bethlehem after this, there was a wonderful wedding. And Boaz married Ruth in that city. And Naomi rejoicing as well. And even after that, that family was united together. There's Boaz and there's Ruth. The Lord blessed them with a little child. And that child's name is an interesting name. It's Obed. There's many people say that whenever they're tired and they come to their bedrooms at night and they're so tired after the long day they just look at their bed and they go, oh, bed. And then they just fall into it. That's what Boaz and Ruth named their son, Obed. And then Obed would have a son and his name would be Jesse. And Jesse would have a number of sons, but the youngest was a man by the name of David. David became one of the greatest, if not the greatest, kings in all of Israel. And you know, if you keep tracing down through the generations and down through the family, after David, you go down through his sons and it carries on and on. And then you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, isn't it a wonderful thought when you consider it? There was Ruth, a lady, a woman out of the city and out of the country of Moab. A stranger to all, of the, all about God, a stranger to his law, a stranger to his love, a stranger to his word. And yet in God's mercy and God's grace, he brought her to Naomi. And then he brought her with Naomi back to Bethlehem. And she turned away from her own country. She turned away from her own gods. And she said, the Lord, your God is now my God. She put her faith and trust in Naomi's God, Naomi's Savior. And then she came back. She had that blessing of becoming Boaz's wife. It's a wonderful picture of salvation. We all begin and we're born in sin. We're shaped in iniquity. We're strangers to God. We know nothing about Him. And yet God in His mercy reveals Himself to us. Even through these online meetings, even through the opportunity of opening up the Scriptures and even reading the, the Scriptures together, God reveals Himself to us. He shows forth His love. He shows forth His mercy. He shows forth even the great sacrifice which Christ made upon the cross. You know, Ruth had that desire to be with Boaz. I wonder tonight, boys and girls, as we finish... Do you have the desire in your heart to be with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have that desire in your heart to be part of His family? To have the Lord Jesus as your own and your personal Savior? You know, it's wonderful, even now in your own home, you can have the Lord Jesus as your Savior if you simply ask Him. You simply repent of your sins. You ask the Lord to save you. You ask the Lord to come into your heart, to come into your life. The Lord's promised He will. The Lord's promised that any one that comes unto him, he will in no wise cast out. And so boys and girls, as we bring this story in the life of Ruth to an end, I encourage you, I plead with you, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in him and rejoice even in the mercy and the love and the grace that he has towards you. We're just going to finish with a wee word of prayer and immediately after we'll have our quiz. But boys and girls, think about what we've been saying. Think about your need of salvation and think about the love of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy precious word. We thank thee for the life of Ruth. We do rejoice in the mercy even towards her. We rejoice, O God, in her kinsman, Redeemer, there in that city of Bethlehem and the man of Boaz. Lord, we thank thee and we praise thee for our Savior, our kinsman, Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. No oh God, we pray that there will be that desire even within the hearts of each and every one this night that's not saved to come and to put their faith and trust in Christ. Be with each one. Bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, so here we are week 10 on our last lesson about Ruth. And now we're going to do the quiz and see how well everyone was listening. 
So as usual, we have Ruben back for the boys and Hannah for the girls. And tonight they have their quality streets with them and their bowls and spoons. So the idea is they're going to put a bowl on their head when they get the answer right. They're going to have 10 seconds to spoon as many sweets as possible into the bowl on their head without spilling on the ground. And you only get points for those that end up in the bowl. Okay, so we have to see who is listening well, first of all. So we'll start with the boys, because the boys have a wee bit of catching up to do. Last week, the girls won, which meant the score is now 7-4 to the girls. So Ruben, do you think you're going to do well in this quiz? Try your best. <laughs> okay, right, we'll make a start. So whose field was Ruth working in at the start of tonight's story? Boaz. Boaz field. Right, so you get your bowl in position on the top of your head. And I will hold it in place for you. Okay, and whenever Jessica tells you to go, you have 10 seconds on the clock. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six. That's 60 points for the boys. Good start. Okay, so over to the girls now, Hannah. Um, and for the girls at home. Both Ruth and Naomi's husbands were dead. So what did that make them? What's the word for someone whose husband is? They were widows, that's right. Okay, so give me your bowl. And when Jessica says go. Okay. okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seventy points for the girls. Right, back to Reuben. Okay, so Naomi explained the law of God to Ruth and sent her to see Boaz. Where was he when she sent him? Remember the harvest had ended and where were all the men gathered now? Remember the name of it? It's a bit hard. It's the threshing floor. That's where he was. Okay, you ready? And we'll put your bowl on top. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, what do we see? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Wow, 130 points, Reuben. Okay, back to the girls. So when Boaz went to sleep, uh, Ruth came in, and what did she put over herself? The bottom of Boaz's blanket. Yes, the bottom of Boaz's blanket. Okay. So, go. go. Okay, so we have two, four, six, eight, nine. Oh dear, one, you might have to eat that at the end. Okay, do you want to set it over in that seat? So 90 points for the girls. Okay, we'll not start to eat it now. Okay, back to you, Reuben. While Je Hannah's gathering up there. Okay. Boaz went to the city gate, and remember he gathered 10 elders, and he waited to talk to the kinsman and tell him about the land that he could buy and that he could marry Ruth. Did this man want to marry Ruth? No. No, he didn't. Okay, give me your bowl. You ready? Go. Remember, we're trying to get them in the bowl. Good. Stop. Okay, three, six, nine, 90 points for the boys. Right, so. So this man didn't want to marry Ruth. So who said that he would become the kinsman redeemer and would take care of and marry Ruth? Boaz. Boaz, yes. Okay, you ready? Go. Oh dear, it's more going around the place. <laughs> okay, 40 points. <laughs> okay, back to Reuben. Okay, what did the kinsman take off as a sign that a deal had been done? His shoe. His shoe, okay. Ready? Go. Whoa. Stop. Okay. 
Okay. So we have two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, 110 points. I think you're doing well tonight, Reuben. Right back to Hannah. So Boaz and Ruth got married and had a baby boy. What did they call this baby boy? Obed. Obed. Yes, that's right. Are you ready to go? Okay, so we have three, six, nine, ninety points for the girls. Oh dear, ninety points for the girls. Back to you, Reuben, for your last one. Who owes a debt that they could never pay, and what is that debt called? No, you might think of the wee chorus. Who owes a debt that? No, he paid the debt, but who owed us. it? Us. And can you remember what the debt is called? It begins with S. Sin, we owe the dad of sin. Yes, okay. You ready? Good man. Okay, so we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A good score to finish. That's 100 points for the boys. Back to you for the last one, Hannah. And if you were listening to Reuben, he gave you the answer. Who paid the debt that he did not owe on Calvary? Jesus, that's right. Last go now, you need to make it a good one. Okay, this is one, two, three, four, five. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, one hundred and sixty points. So we'll have to add up the score. I think it's going to be extremely close. And I think our helpers tonight could get a wee treat of having some sweets. Oh, so the girls got three fifty, but the boys tonight came out on top with 390 points. Well done, Reuben. Excellent. So that means now it is 7-5 to the girls, but you've brought it back a bit, Reuben. Well done. Okay, I think now you deserve a treat. Boys and girls, great job with the quiz once again. Typical boys, very good whenever it comes to sweets being involved, isn't it? But that brings our story and our time of quiz and our time of children's meeting to an end this evening. Thank you again for joining us uh, tonight. And do come and join with us again next Monday night, 7.15, for our last children's meeting of 2020. So you make sure, make that effort to come back and to join with us next Monday night, 7.15, on either Facebook or on our YouTube channel. Boys and girls, bye for now, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.